Yeah. So this is my presentation on uh, doing Linux IoT from prototype to production. Uh, this is actually a talk we have done before. Uh, that's been a one-hour talk, so it has been stripped down a bit. Uh, this is a smaller slot. Uh, a quick overview. So we're going to. Try to refine a bit uh, IoT, what I mean with that, and the markets and so on. And then we'll try to look at uh, some of the communication inter interfaces and protocols that are typical for IoT devices. Uh, but al always uh, looking into what's available, into, for example, in Open Embedded, uh, what kind of uh, flexibilities and packages are included specifically for your IoT. Uh, I will also take a look at the uh, application development frameworks and some deployment considerations when looking into IoT. Uh, so quickly about me, uh, I work with Embedded Linux. I've been doing it for almost a decade now. The last few years it's been mainly around uh, Yocto uh, focus. <coughs> uh, my day job is at Mender. We do over the air software updates for Embedded Linux, an open source project. Uh, so, Internet of Things, this is the Wikipedia definition. Uh, basically, it means connecting all the things in the world and connecting them to the, to the Internet. That's the short, short version. Uh, the longer version, uh, the taming the Internet of Things uh, naming zoo, everyone kind of invents their own name for the same things. So, there's a lot of like uh, internet, of the internet of Everything, Internet of. Industrial Internet of Things, uh, Vehicle to Everything, that's the automotive term, uh, Digital Twin, so there's a lot of names for the same thing. Uh, and I'm focusing on uh, devices running uh, embedded Linux, because that's where we operate through it. Uh, so this is another further explanation of what's Internet of Things. Basically, it's in everything, so we have Linux running in all kinds of devices, and I find it a bit funny to you know, observe these. Uh, not, these are not taken by me, uh, but this one actually was taken by me. I was at a, a science fair in Gothenburg. Uh, I see Saturn, I think. It has uh, some issues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You could actually see it was a Raspberry Pi and crashing. Yeah. So it's fun. Uh, I mean, it's everywhere. Uh, and some applications <laughs> that are common for IoT, or uh, I mean, it's very popular in uh, transportation and automotive. And that's kind of where it kind of grew out of. It's been around for a very long time in that specific sector. And it's used for in vehicle entertainment, telematics, uh, fleet management, and so on. Construction and buildings, uh, infrastructure, cities, uh, these kind of applications. Uh, Energy, that's a pretty big sector as well. Uh, and then we have the things, it's everything else that's connected, the variables. The so there's a lot of things <laughs> that are getting connected. Um, and then we kind of get into the components of an IoT stack or a device that's connected. Uh, typically there is some kind of cloud infrastructure uh, where your devices are connecting and feeding uh, the cloud with data, where you kind of do post-processing and analytic analytics of the data that you are pushing. And there are hundreds of these solutions, uh, cloud solutions. So you know, all the big ones have it, Google IoT Core, Azure IoT, uh, Amazon has one thing. Uh, so there's a lot of options in this field to connect your devices. Uh, and looking at uh, Open and Embedded, there's actually a pretty good uh, Layer. Uh, it's called Meta IoT Cloud because these cloud vendor cloud uh, solutions typically have some kind of SDK that you need to put on your device to be able to communicate with that specific uh, cloud vendor. And there are some supported platforms for with this in this layer. Uh, which is, uh, so if you're looking into this, take a look at this layer what it provides and use that and extend it. Uh, then we kind of get to connectivity options. Uh, not all these are relevant to like embedded Linux devices, but this is typically what's used in this uh, kind of uh, in this field. Uh, so there's a lot of connectivity options depending on if you are doing short range. You have a couple of options, uh, medium distance. So home automation is a big thing, and kind of these protocols or radios. This is more uh, 
on the hardware layer. So you have Zigbee and the thread that are kind of competing with each other, who's going to dominate the home automation. Uh, Wi-Fi was an option as well. A uh, couple of more uh, connectivity options. So LoRa is getting a lot of attention. Uh, this is typically like a city-wide, uh, it can be a lot of city, build up city-wide networks of connected devices. Uh, but typically here the battery life is measured in years of the these devices and also very low data rate. So maybe you send one data package a day to just... Uh, and then we have the cellular uh, LTE, Wi-Fi internet, which is uh, very common to use. And there, there are plenty a lot more. Uh, I don't really have uh, time to mention them all. And this is a pretty fun one, funny one that's uh, classic in this field. That uh, we have 14 competing standards. Let's create one standard that unifies them all. And then you kind of get the situation where now you have 15 competing <coughs> standards. And it's pretty typical for this IoT. Uh, there's a lot of things, and a lot of standards uh, competing. So looking a bit more on like communication, uh, you have these uh, interfaces that are, uh, provide connectivity and there is a uh, communication protocols that you apply on top of that. And MQTT is a very popular one. Uh, typically all these big cloud providers use MQTT, which you can, uh, and MQTT is a simple public subscribe model. Uh, so the devices can push data and then uh, your cloud infrastructure can subscribe and forward it to all the other locations. The good thing about MQTT is it's a standard, so it's standardized. Uh, and it also has built-in security for like TLS or TCP. But MQTT requires TCP, and there is an MQTT for sensor networks, which is a, uh, optimized for lower bandwidth, uh, but which does not require TCP. Uh, and I find it funny that they, they used to call it the MQTTS, but they kind of removed it because people assumed it steps and was secure. So they, kind of, <laughs> they don't want people to assume that it's secure, right? So they kind of changed the name, but I find it a bit funny. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so and there, there's a lot of these. So MQTT is one way of communicating. Uh, you have the standard HTTP uh, RESTful APIs that you can use technologies. Then you kind of get into, if you care about uh, performance and latency, then you kind of get into DDS uh, and zero MQ, uh, which kind of gives you more flexibility to build a stack, which is optimized for the use case, typically for throughput or latency. Uh, they will kind of start looking into this. Co-app uh, is a constrained application protocol inherits a lot of the HTTP stuff, so it works in a very similar way as HTTP, but uh, uh, smaller code base and more for constrained devices and so on. Uh, and then there's also OPC Unified Dash Vector, which is another uh, network middleware, middleware for uh, optimizations so, of uh, the stack. I'm uh, looking into uh, open embedded. Uh, there is recipes for all of these things. So in meta networking, for example, there is a Mosquito, which is a MQTT broker uh, provided by the Clips Foundation, I think. Uh, and then you have in meta open embedded and uh, cli MQTT clients for also the Paho MQTT client, which is also from the Clips Foundation. And then you have zero MQ as well, recipes for that, for the C and C++ uh, libraries. But there are Python modules for this as well, uh, which have bind Python bindings for both uh, Power MQTT and zero MQ, which can be used. And since MetaRoss has adopted this DDS, uh, they are using something called the ePROSIMA Fast RTPS, which is an open source implementation of uh, DDS. Uh, uh, so they have a recipe for that. Uh, well, I can take a look, look at that. Now we kind of get into, you have your communications uh, set up or frameworks and kind of 
can build on top of that with, with application development frameworks that are fairly common, uh, commonly used in, in, in this uh, field. Uh, so we have Node-RED, uh, I'll cover these a bit more uh, in the next slides. Uh, but Node-RED, Node.js, Eclipse Cura, uh, Qt, uh, there's a lot more of these uh, that are typically used to, you know, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? There, was, there are tools for the food that look into this already. Uh, but in Open Embedded, we also have a lot of language availability, so we can choose uh, what we want to write our applications or stacks in. So looking at bit that, for example, Node-RED, uh, which is an Open uh, JS Foundation project, uh, licensed under Apache, Apache 2.0. Uh, what it kind of adds is you get a browser-based editing uh, of your logic, uh, and it's based on something they call flows and nodes, uh, which you kind of connect in a browser editing mode to do your IoT logic, which is kind of listening to some kind of traffic from some interface, maybe processing it and then sending it to the cloud. Uh, and you can define this in a very simple way uh, using these. And there is also a very large database of these flows where you can kind of reuse uh, the flows that someone else has designed. Uh, kind of co collaboration around that because uh, the use cases are fairly similar. Uh, and a similar one um, from the Eclipse Foundation is something called Eclipse Cura, uh, also Apache 2.0, uh, but also provides browser based editing. But this one is built on Java. Uh, but it has built-in APIs for serial ports, watchdogs, GPS, GPIOs. It kind of supports these uh, connected sensors to your device. Uh, and it also provides some ready-to-use field protocols. So, for example, Modbus, which is a, maybe a common uh, communication interface. So it has these built-in uh, modules that you can reuse and then kind of connect. Uh, and they also have like support for cloud, cloud vendors. So they integrate, for example, with the GCP you know, IoT core, uh, fairly straightforward. Um, any questions so far? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah so very interesting to hear about MQTT. <coughs> we do a lot of stuff with MQTT. Mm. I was hearing over the weekend about ROS, for ROS2 going over to the D DDS, is mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Um, and so what I've heard from them is that they've been trying to get away from this sort of centralized master mm -hmm. situation, the single point of failure. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the discussions we've been having is about the broker with MQTT and that potentially being the single point of failure. Mm -hmm. um, does this DDS get away from that then? It's, it seems to sort of do service discovery and it's distribution and I couldn't work out what was going yeah. on with it. A lot of these, if we go back to the where our list is, uh, so yeah, yeah. I mean, DDS and the Zero MQ, for example, kind of allow you to design your own. Uh, so you can have a, you can design it like a broker interface. You can do it peer to peer or client server. Uh, so they kind of give you the flexibility to. I mean, adds complexity because you you need to define how you want to work and so on. Uh, so that's the. I mean, when you are looking to optimize things, I think this these. Standards and tools give you the option to I mean, design it the way you like. It's, it's probably a naive question, but you know I can understand how I've got a lot of uh, modules, maybe on, on the same sort of local bus, and, and they're publishing topics and subscribing to other topics, and that all goes through uh, a, a broker server. Hmm. And I can see that, but I can't see how this these other sort of sets of middleware distribute that. I mean, hmm. do. do do all the messages go all over the place, or how, how is how is it's multicast? Hmm? It's multicast. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. But yeah, definitely look into them if you're looking to optimize. Um, MQTT is the like a lot of people start with it, and uh, but it does uh, like yeah, it doesn't perform well when you scale and so on. So then you can start looking into these alternatives. Is that what they're using though? Fast RTPS <coughs> because that's just the the base layer, isn't it? So, is there a PDS that's open source? Yeah, from these guys, yeah. from uh, 
Yeah, that's <coughs> one of the problems. That, uh, look, when I kind of looked into it uh, in the DDS, there's a lot of like proprietary uh, implementations of the standard. Uh, but these guys actually have uh, the ePROSIMA, e and they have an open source version uh, that, is, that they claim is fully DDS compliant. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't tried it out, but uh, they do have a commercial version as well. But, uh, and it's on their GitHub, so if you look and you get the slides, uh, take a look. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, sure. Uh, and a lot of people I, I find Qt uh, is a, a lot of people associate Qt with graphical interfaces. Uh, so if you're building graphics, you maybe use Qt. Uh, but Qt actually has a lot of these IoT uh, protocols and things that we would use uh, in these devices in its core. So it has like Qt and QTD modules. It actually has a Qt co-op as well uh, and some serial interfaces implementations. So it could be considered as an alternative as well, uh, utilizing the Qt core alone. Uh, there is a licensing thing with Qt that needs to be considered, but uh, there's a lot of discussions going on right now. They are changing it, so. Mm -hmm. But it's still, they kind of implement all of these things as modules, which kind of makes it easier to develop. Uh, not trying to reinvent, reinvent the wheel. And then we're kind of getting to the final steps. So, I mean, when you're kind of building this stack, uh, yeah, you, the, the characteristics of IoT devices are typically that they are distributed, they're hard to get to, so you kind of need to work out the deployment model, how you're going to deploy your software. This is, this is what I work a lot with uh, my daily basis. This is something that we think uh, one needs to consider when building uh, these type of devices. And some considerations, I mean, device lifetimes impacts a lot. So you're going to support this device for uh, two years or five years or 10 years. This kind of impacts what kind of model you need to approach you need to take to your deployment. Uh, you have the option of, of managed or unmanaged fleet. So do you have a direct control of your devices or how do you get an overview? If you have 10,000 devices, how do you get an overview or your devices and of your deployment model on these devices, what kind of software are they running, how do you deploy software to all of them or one of them and so on. Yeah. I gotta take, a, take <coughs> into consideration the operating environment uh, because these devices can be connected to unreliable power, so if they can lose power at any time that kind of needs to go into consideration, design considerations, uh, what kind of environment the device will be in, if it's going to be in a vehicle, then it's going to move, move around, that kind of brings some challenges and so on. Can the user modify the software and uh, impact a lot of the design decisions? Uh, bandwidth, as, as I mentioned, uh, is it going to have the Ethernet connectivity or is it mobile connectivity? That kind of impacts uh, what kind of choices or you have to take in the deployment. I'm looking at, I mean, the S in IoT stands for security. Uh, and there's a lot of media attention around, lately around IoT devices are a very attractive target for botnets and things like that. So people have realized that there's millions of these devices and they're unsecure, so it's pretty easy to get access to them. Uh, and the only way to remedy this is basically by be able to deploy uh, software updates to them to keep them up to date with the latest security fixes. Uh, obviously, use well maintained software and keep it up to date is a very uh, requirement. And then there are some general security practices. So, principle of least privilege, separation of privilege, and uh, the Shannon's maxim. So, don't try to do security by uh, obfuscation. So, assume that every, that people will find out what your device contains and uh, assume that from the beginning and design your security around that instead of trying to hide uh, by changing SSH port. I didn't really hope that they're going to find out. <laughs> uh, so yeah. 
can expect that it's going to be funded. So, OTA updates must have, yeah, of course. Uh, so I'm not going to go into too much in the OTA solutions. There are plenty of them. Uh, but there is a good uh, wiki on the Octo project uh, page, which is fairly up to date. Uh, it kind of contains a summary of all the available solutions uh, that have an integration with Open Embedded. So I recommend you to take a look at that and uh, what kind of fits your uh, project needs and so on. And I think, yeah, that's it for me. Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you.